My name is Kim Dalsko. I um, work as a independent consultant in um, web and iOS development. And I will uh, tell you about supporting offline mobile web applications via HTML5. So I got a little agenda here. First point is uh, application cache. That's how we can take uh, our skeleton and and uh, persist it on the on the mobile device, so we don't have to have online access to to actually run the the, the app, the mobile app. <coughs> the next tree is is um, different way of storing our data. It is very important here to to separate the the application and the data that the application uses. Um, it's a common pitfall to um, to put all in, in the app cache, and, and then terrible things can happen. So uh, first of all, how do we um, take care of the application? And then uh, three uh, different um, perspectives on, on saving the data on the telephone or the, at the device, too. So let's start with the application cache. Is that big enough to read, or should I make the font bigger? Fine. OK, this is from the, the, H, the um, W3C um, um, spec. And it, it's just telling us what we can expect from this specification. It's, it's about taking our web application and, and use them when, when we are not connected to the, to the internet. <coughs> And the way we do it is by providing a, a manifest. So this guy is uh, Jack Archibald. He, is a, he was a um, lead developer by Lanyard. And he's now transferring to Google. And uh, he has been traveling the world with, with, this, um, with this talk called Application Cache is a Douchebag. And if you look in, uh, in Urban Dictionary, uh, a douchebag is something like, like this. In um, over-inflated sense of self-worth. <coughs> um, so it's not very um, flattering to be called a douchebag. And I think maybe it's, it's too harsh to call, uh, call uh, application cache a, a douchebag. I, will, I prefer uh, comparing application cache to my sister-in-law and she uh, helps me out uh, with my do-it-yourself jobs at, at home. And, um, and she's not very good at it, but she is very eager to help. So last time she was there, she was um, drilling uh, eight millimeter holes in a, a wooden door so that she could put uh, wall plugs in and, and screw in screws. Um, so I think that's the kind of... Uh, of, of a guy, this app cache is uh, eager to help, but but we take care. It, it it's not always uh, as good as it says it is. Okay, uh, now the technical parts. Um, to to use an app cache, we have to to include a um, an attribute manifest in the HTML tag and then refer a manifest file on the server. And usually this file is called cache manifest, but it's, it's a, you can have free, free choice. <coughs> the files that are referencing a given manifest file will go into the app cache as master entry. We'll see why this is important later. So um, a manifest file consists of uh, four different sections. The first section is a header. And the very first line should read cache manifest. And there should be no uh, empty lines above. We do comments like uh, this with a hash mark. <coughs> And then we have a cache section, a fallback section, and a network section. And I'll go through these in a moment. 
When serving a cache manifest file, we have to serve it with the content type text slash cache manifest. In, it's about to be dropped, this uh, restriction, but in, in the implementations now in both uh, Chrome and, and Firefox, we have to, to uh, give the right MIME type or we, it won't be treated as a cache manifest file. Oh, that was the cache part. <coughs> the cache part is where we put in the files that we want to be under uh, app cache control. So here we put uh, the style sheets, the JavaScript files, and the like. We there's the the, the file that that has the cache manifest. It's it's no. Um, you don't have to mention that once again. It, it, it will be in the cache, uh, and you don't have to do anything to, to put it there. The resources has to be loaded with the same protocol as the manifest file, but do not have to come from the same origin. So if it's a HTTP cache, all the, the files that are in the cache has to be HTTP and not HTTPS, for example. <coughs> Fallback. Here you can, if, you, if there's files that you don't want in, in your cache, maybe there are, there are big images or something like that, you can, you can provide fallbacks for these. So here I, I say images slash cars should be replaced by images slash cars, gray car, the JPEG if we are on offline. So, and we can, we can uh, give a, a URL namespace or we can give an absolute URL here to, to the fallback. <coughs> and the fallback resources have to come from the same origin as, as the manifest file. The network part is, uh, is, is uh, very important and, and um, misunderstand. Uh, in this part, we, if we don't provide a network uh, section here, we, cannot, we can only serve files that are in the cache, application cache. So <coughs> if our application has to go to the internet and, and, and get other files, if it's online, you have to specify something in, in a network section. And if you specify a uh, asterisk, it will be possible to, to uh, go to any resource on the internet with the same protocol. If you specify something more specific like this, <coughs> you'll be restricted only to, to use these resources from within uh, the cache. You can omit the, the cache section if you put something between the cache manifests header and, and the first section. It will be included in, in, the, in the cache as if it were in a cache section. This is a little trap if the, the, the browser cache is still active underneath uh, the application cache. So if, if uh, you, you request something from your application cache, it will go to the browser's normal cache. And that can be a little bit dangerous. We'll see that in, in a moment. Here we had the double refresh deal. If, if we are, we don't wait um, to see if we are online if we are requesting something that's on the cache, application cache control, we are shown the page instantly, and then afterwards, we'll go and see if we are online. So if we are online and there's a, something new to our cache, then that will be loaded, but the page will not be reloaded. So we have to make a double reload if something has changed, and we'll see that in a moment. If we delete a manifest file, 
then the cached, the application cache will be deleted on the client. So that's a way to get rid of, of being on the ca uh, application cache control. So we can just remove the, the, the cache manifest, and, and then the, the cached file will be removed. Yes, um, this, was, this is actually enough to, um, to make a, a um, application, to put our web application on the cache control. But if that's not uh, what we want, there is a an, 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 uh, an nice API to the application cache, too. So uh, it's placed on the application cache property on the Windows object. And that is the cache for this given um, master entry. So this. Um, This object has a uh, property called status. <coughs> and here we can see what are the status of our um, application cache. Uncached, that means that this is not under any cache control. And idle, that means that we are in a, a steady mode. We, we have collected what there is to be collected, and we have refreshed, and so on. There are some methods. There's an update method. When calling this update method, we will, we will go and see if there's any changes. <coughs> and the, to see if there's any changes, the app cache is looking for changes in the manifest file. So per, per definition, if the manifest file hasn't changed, there's nothing new to the cache. And if the manifest file has changed, then we will reload the whole cache. If we will regret this operation, we can, we can call abort, and then it will stop. Maybe we are on a, a edge network and, and, uh, and do not want to, to wait for the cache to, to download. And when we are succeeded, we can call swap cache, and then the new cache will, will come in, the newly downloaded cache. But it will not reload the page. So resources being asked for after this swap case, swap <coughs> cache will, will pick files from, from the new cache. This is, is uh, seldom used. Normally, we, you will make a reload of the, of the whole page. There are events that we can listen on, listen for. Um, Checking is the first event that we will get. It will get it when, when we're starting and uh, to, to look for, for an, a, a new update. The next event we can get is a no update. That means that the manifest file is the same manifest files, file at, that we have on the, on the client. Downloading, that means that we have found a difference between the two manifest files, and we are now downloading the cache again. And progress, we are getting progress events, um, so we can see that something is, is happening. Cached, that means that this, is, this event will only fire when we, for the first time, is caching uh, the web application. So, so the first time that we are taking this page on the, on the cache control, we'll have a cached event file. And afterwards, when we have downloaded uh, a new version, we'll get an update ready. We can get an obsolete. That was what we saw before. If, you, if, if the manifest file is gone, <coughs> then we, we will get an obsolete event, and, and the cache will be cleared. And lastly, we can have an error. That means that something went terrible wrong. Yes, we can try to, uh, to take this, these slides uh, offline. 
we'll look at the code. Go and find the app cache file. And here at the HTML tag, we'll just put in a manifest equals cache manifest. And now we need to make a cache manifest. I think we will steal one from here. <coughs> so now I have made a, a cache manifest file, and, and I'm <coughs> referring um, the style sheets and the JavaScript files that makes up this application. I have a single fallback here. <coughs> I say the stylesheet github.css should be replaced by stylesheet espresso libra CSS when we are offline. And I say that the network, you can, you can fetch whatever you want from the network. So let's see if we reload the page. Is it error? That's not good. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I did that in the HTML file. Scary, scary. Yeah. So we, when the new um, now we introduced app cache to, to this uh, site and, and, uh, and we sent a no, we got back a checking event. It found the, the uh, manifest file. We started downloading. There was some uh, progress, and then suddenly there was a cache. And now we are under cache control. So let's try to kill the server. Now we should be offline. So let's do it again. What is it saying this time? For errors. Cache. OK, that's two files I have missed. So if, if we are missing any files, we will get an error. We, we can't use a cache that is not complete. So we. We have a, a fully functional cache or no cache. That's the two, um, two possibilities. So we'll go and fix this. Cache manifest. App cache CSS. Organizer. Stop it. <laughs> uh, organizer. MOD, E, R, N, E, C, R. Can I spell modernizer? Ah, stop the server, yeah, right. We have to reload it while we are. Yeah. That's great. And now we can stop the server again. Now we have a new copy. Yeah. Right. Checking failed, and it's not failing.
Oh, that's the error here we are getting. So what happens here is that the, we can't fetch the manifest file. So, so uh, for normal purposes, this is on now under cache control. So we can see the style sheet has changed for the, for the, the code. And we are now showing this page without being online. So now we're back online again, and it should change. The, now the cache is playing a game with me, the browser cache. So it is a kind of a little bit of douchebaggy. Um, <laughs> But it, it actually works if you have the time to just fiddle it. Now I think everything is, is back to normal. So there is a working group working on, on making this better. But, but I think it's, as it is right now, it's, it's usable. And, and you, can, you can take a look at what's happening underneath by, um, by using Chrome's tools. The resources we can see there is a, there's a cache here. We can see which files are, are in the cache and, and why they are in the cache. And we can go and look at Chrome's app cache internals. And we can look at the actual files that are in the cache. And, and see the HTTP uh, responses for these files. So even if it's a little bit tricky to, to, uh, to use, there's, there's a good tooling for it. And, and uh, when you have it working, you, you, um, it, is, it is stable. So now I, I have, when I have this one under cache control, I, I don't have to worry much about it anymore. The cache, application cache is only for, for the skeleton of, uh, of the application. It's, if you use it for, for data, it, it, uh, it tends to, to go wrong. Um, if, if you change something, you have to reload um, the whole cache. So if, if you, if you uh, decided to, to, to pick one Point one data file instead of another data file, you have to reload your whole app. So I, I, don't, I, I prefer not to use the app cache as, as a data storage. So, and here's a little look at where we can use it. <coughs> and on the mobile side, uh, it's in uh, iOS, and it's on Android, and it's coming on on the Windows phone. So it's, it's uh, perfectly usable right now. OK, next up is, is one of the three different uh, storage mechanisms. Uh, and this is the most simple of them all. It's local storage. And it's just a giant hash map in, in, in the browser. This particular storage type is spanning a, a, a single origin. So <coughs> it's for a given origin. And, and the browser has different hash tables, different local storage for each origin that it's, it, it, it meets. So it's, it's perfectly safe to use. You cannot, you cannot go into another pages, um, and other origins, a hash map, and, and do anything there. So um, this, 
This is an important part of it. Um, the keys are strings, so you can't use you can't use a a, a, a number. Uh, you, you you can use a number, but it it is converted to a string. Everything is converted to a string before it's used as a as a key. And and similar values are are, are strings. So if you have complex objects and you want to store them in, in local storage, you have to serialize them as, as JSON or something like that. There is a get item method that's, uh, that takes a, a key and returns a value. And you get a, a null back if, if, uh, if the key do not exist. There's a set item. Uh, taking a key and a value, and, and if the key is already in use, the value is replaced, and otherwise a new key value pair is, is added. Remove item, take a key, and remove the item from the, the map. And there's a clear that clears the whole, the whole uh, local storage. So you as a client can always get rid of of the database. There's a length, so you can ask how many key value pairs are there in the database. And there is a key, takes an, an integer, and give back the key the, from the given key set at that index. <coughs> There's a little bit of Syntactic sugar on top of this, you can use um, square brackets to, uh, as you can in normal objects. I think that is the preferred way to, to, uh, to use this key store. Here's a little example. I, I think I will go for uh, the, the console example instead. We can at any uh, origin, we can go in and say, give us local storage. And then we get a storage ob object back, and we can look in that and say, OK, it has a key. I have been playing around with it. So let's, let's say local storage dot clear. So now we have a, a MT storage object, length zero. So we can, we can add a, a key and a value. Some string. Take a look at the object again. Yeah, we have a foo bar. Uh, key in. So if we try to store something that is not by a key that is not a, a string, for example, one, we look at the storage again, we can see it has actually converted this, you can't see that, but it has converted um, the key to a string. If we use a more complex thing, for example, a function, we can declare a function if as oops, uh, it's a very simple function, and we use that function as a, as a uh, key. We can store a value for it. That went well, and we can use the same f to, to get it back. But if we make another function with the same, this looks exactly the same, we'll get foo back. That's because the function is converted to a string. Everything is converted to a string and, and then used as a key. So be careful with 
no, non-strings. Like the key here is, is the function as a string. <coughs> There is a event. You can listen for an event called storage on window. And if we have two sessions open in the same in the same origin, on the same origin, we'll get an event from the if we change a key, we'll get an event in the other session. So we can synchronize um, two pages from, from the same origin that way. There's some limitations. There's only one hash map per origin. So we have to put all of our data in, in, in one table. And it's synchronous. One of the few things in JavaScript that is synchronous, this API. So if you store <coughs> really big uh, amounts of data, you, you will, um, it, it will take time to, um, you'll, you'll find that, that everything else is, is going to a hold. So you have to take this into consideration if, uh, if you choose it. Uh, it's, a, it's a very simple way to, uh, to get storage. So if, if you can live with these limitations, it's, it's very, very easy to use. So when can we use? There's support almost all over. Uh, you sh we need to go back to Internet Explorer 7 for, for finding something that do not uh, understand this. And on the mobile side, there's all green. <coughs> the next possibility is a web SQL database. This is an API for storing data in database that can be queried using a variant of SQL. And this is actually a, a way of getting um, a handle on a SQLite database. So, so uh, if you're familiar with SQLite, it's, it's, uh, it's very familiar to you to use this. There is a problem that's that the specification is no longer in active maintenance. So one of the reasons why this has happened is that to be a specification in W3C, you, there has to be two implementations. And nobody wants to re-implement SQLite just to make this a, a specification. So they have abandoned this. And, but there's still a great support for, for this on mobile devices. So opening a database, there's three different ways to do that. First, you can give a, a name, a version, a longer name, and the initial size of the database in bytes. You can also give a function as the last parameter. And that function will be called um, for the first time the database is created. So you have a chance to initialize it. A problem with these two is that if you don't, if you guess wrong with the version number, then you'll just get an error back and, and, uh, and you can't do anything. So the best way to open a database is by not supplying a, a, a version, give it an empty string, and then you'll get a database back in the newest version there is. You can then ask if this version of the you have just opened has the same version number as the one you expected to get. And if this is not true, then you can call change version, give it the parameter of the current version, the version you want to go to, and then 
three callbacks, change, error, and success. And the change function will take as the first parameter and transaction. And this, in this transaction, you can alter the, the schema of the database. So here we have a migration path you can go to. So if, if, you are, if your database is, is brand new, you will give it version 0. Or otherwise, you will just take the pass int of the, the version. And then you can say, OK, if, if, you're in, if you're older than 1, please do this. If you're older than 2, please do this, and, and so on. So you have a migration path you can go to to get all database schemas synchronized. You can't just push a new database schema to a, to a client. You have to, to wait for him to, to open the database. If something goes wrong, it will call error. And if, if it succeeded, <coughs> we'll now have a database with the, the new and, and the asked for version number. Changing the database scheme, we use um, the transaction that we, we were given in, in, the, in the change callback. And we can execute SQL on, on, the, on that transaction. And we can do something like create table, alter table, and, and so on. So here we, we can change the database scheme, and we can, we can add in data or delete data. We can, when we are finished with the database, we can do transactions on that database too. <coughs> we can um, make a transaction by calling transaction and give a callback to that function. And we can do SQL stuff in, in, uh, in, the, in that callback term, uh, function here. And we can provide an extra uh, error and an extra success callback so that we can get notified when, when the transaction is, is over or if it failed. We can also make a read-only transaction so that we only have read capacities but, but do not um, hinder other in, in writing in the database. Yeah, um, we, can, we can execute SQL. This is an insert statement, and, uh, and the question marks here are, are just um, replaced by, by parameters in, in the next uh, parameter and, and array. <coughs> we can get a result set back. <coughs> When we do an SQL statement, we get a transaction and a result set back in the success. And we can then transfer, tra <coughs> tra traverse this, uh, this result set. If you look at the, the support for, for Web SQL, we can see and, and the, in the mobile side, we have full support in uh, iOS and full support in Android. So even in, in the newest version of, of iOS, there's support for, for, for WebSQL. So I don't think it will go away in, in, the, in the near future. The only problem here is uh, what would happen in, if, uh, if uh, Microsoft's phone takes off. I don't think they will implement this specification. So, so if, if, uh, if you have plans of, of, of being compatible with, with uh, Microsoft Windows Phone, you, you uh, should maybe consider the, the last choice here. <coughs> and 
the last choice here is IndexedDB, Index Database. That was uh, introduced as a replacement for, for uh, WebSQL when they abandoned that. And um, there's a common pattern in the IndexedDB, and uh, it is that if you call an, an object with an operation, then you get a request back. And on that request, you can attach uh, on success and on error callbacks. We can open a database. There is a special callback here called on upgrade needed. We are providing a name and a version. And if that version do not um, match the version that is currently in the database, upgrade needed will be called. And in that upgrade needed, we can do a uh, schema manipulation. So that's almost the same as we saw in, in, uh, in WebSQL. We have a function here where, where we can do the schema migration uh, jobs. And the, the success function here will be called when the upgrade is, is done. <coughs> We can create object stores, and an object store here is, is similar to a, a table in, in a, an SQL world. And we can, um, so that's, that's kind of a, a bucket where we can put in uh, adjacent documents. We can, we can um, if we just make a, 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 a object store called foo, we will have to provide keys for uh, every object that we put in. If we provide a key path when we create the object store, <coughs> the object store will go and look after this property on the objects that we store and use that as a key. If we give an auto increment true, then we have an auto Matic uh, feature that gives, um, that gives keys to our objects. It's like a sequence uh, where we draw um, numbers from. And if we give both a key path and a auto increment true, then we will make, automatically make keys and the key will be stored in, in the key path property. We can make indexes, and an index has a name and a property. That means that we are making an index here called name, and we are picking out the, the property name on our objects and, and store that in the index. We can tell it to be unique, and we can only have one value per Per, um, per index, and we can tell it to be a multi-entry true. That means that the property here, emails, is an array of emails. For each of these, there will be an entry in the email index. We can make transactions. We do that on the database. We specify here what are the object stores that we want to include in our transaction? So we are spanning over the two buckets here called foo and bar. We can span over all the, the buckets by giving an empty array. We can make read-write or read-only uh, transactions. If we only give a single string here, it's, it's the same as giving a, a away with a single value in it. If we have created a transaction, we can attach an uncomplete, on error, and on abort callbacks on the transaction. And there is no explicit send or run or anything on a transaction. The transaction is run the next time we hit the, um, 
the event loop on the browser. So we don't have explicitly to say, OK, go. That takes a little bit getting used to <coughs> when writing the code. <coughs> error events uh, bubbles. So you can, you can attach an, an error handler to your database. And if there goes anything wrong in a transaction, the, the event will bubble and, and end here in this callback. Yeah, adding data, you can add. Again, this is asynchronous uh, data adding. So we have to make a, a, trans a, a request for adding data. And we yeah, will attach an uh, unsuccess. So we are having a call by when the data is actually stored. So this is, uh, this is a lot of code, but it gives us the possibility to, to store things asynchronously. We can add data requires that the that key is is a, is a new key, and if we use put, we will overwrite anything that's in the key. And we can get data again. We uh, we call get, and we get a request back, and on that request, we'll put a a callback, and when the callback fires, we have gotten data. There's a little bit more compact way of, of writing the same code here. It, this is assuming that, that we are handling errors on the database level. So we, we're just attaching an unsuccess here. <coughs> but we can chain, chain the calls. We can remove data. That's uh, the same pattern as we saw. And there's a possibility to prevent default that's normal uh, DOM scripting. So if we catch an error and we don't want it to bubble, we can prevent default. Then there's cursors. And cursors make us, give us the possibility to traverse our buckets, our uh, object stores. <coughs> the main thing about these Cursors is that we are getting this callback is called every, for every element, and we call continue to get the next call. To, so this is a kind of tail recursive way of, of doing it. We can use when when we get a cursor. <coughs> The cursor has a key and a value, and the value is the object that we stored under the given key. That's not so important. So this is an index. So we can get a, 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 a a value from an index by calling get the first element. Get on, oh sorry, get the get the element with the key one. So that's the way. If 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 we know the key, we can get the element out. <coughs> but we can also open a a cursor on a on an index, as we could open a cursor on a on a uh, object store. We can make a key cursor, and then we are not getting back the values. We are only getting back the keys. So we, we, if the keys give any meaning to us, we can traverse the keys and find out which element do we do want to have the value for. It's a cheaper operation, but we have to make another call to get the actual value. We can make ranges. So we say, I want the keys from 10 to 20. This is a very simple value a range uh, consisting of only one element. But we can make them more complicated. We can see lower bound 4. That's 4 and lower. We can see lower bound 4 
comma true, that's lower than four, and so on. We have an upper and a bound that give us the possibility to, to uh, limit in both ends. <coughs> we can change the cursor's direction. From, we can, no, normally, it's, it's the next, so we start in the, from the start and, and then go up. We can do an opposite, and here we have next unique. It will jump over uh, the keys that has already been been um, been used, and previous unique. If there was a last um, callback on the on the database that we haven't been looked at yet. That's uh, unblocking, unblocked. If we have two tabs open with the same database, we can update the one and not the other. So if the database is open and we try to open yet another in another version that we have open uh, in, the, in the other tab, we'll get a callback here, unblocked. So we have to close all other tabs to, to actually be able to, to update this database. This is a, 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 a newer specification, so, so there's, a, there's vendor prefixes. So if, if you will use this, you have to, to just bypass the vendor prefixes, something like, something like this. When can I use? It's all wet on the mobile side here. And that's not good. <laughs> But I think it's the specification of the future. I think in, in, in a year or two, we will see that this will get in all the major browsers. We can take a look at the complete. Here, we can see that for Chrome for Android, Firefox for Android, there's already support. What we can do while waiting is we can use this Shim that takes IndexedDB and put it on top of WebSQL. So this is the same implement, almost the same as, as Firefox has done. Firefox has put IndexedDB on top of uh, SQLite. So this guy has, has done the same. He's taking the the WebSQL database that is a SQLite, and, and he has put the index DB on top of it. So I think this is a fairly good way to go until, until, um, until the specification, uh, until the implementations is catching up. Sorry, <laughs> this was that. That was all. For, sorry if I have delayed. Yeah, I have. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you.